Welcome everybody to the third lecture. This is our third one. We are in week three. Um, I'm Anja Hitzenberger. I started Strudel Media Live online classes. I just want to say hello. I'm very happy you're all here. Um, I decided to uh, offer these uh, lectures because of the crazy situation that we are in all over the world. I just felt like I wanted to help somehow. And um, I uh, was uh, very lucky to find um, a <clears throat> an organization called the Migrant Kitchen, a nonprofit catering company who cooks for um, people in need, um, for hospital workers, but also other people in need. They're here in New York. I'm sitting in New York City. And now I want to introduce um, uh, Kai McBride. Um, I'm very excited that he is moderating the talk today. Um, we met uh, through Michael Chovan, who uh, runs um, a really great podcast. It's called The Real Photo Show. And uh, Kai uh, used to be the co-host uh, for, for that podcast. And I was on that po podcast a while ago. And that's how Kai and I met. And um, Kai um, worked for uh, 10 years. He, he, he uh, was teaching uh, and, and running the darkroom for 10 years at Columbia University in New York before he recently uh, moved to Santa Fe. And um, I'm very fortunate that Kai is teaching for Strudel Media Life. He has taught the black and white class and he will teach the bookmaking class that I mentioned. Um, he's very knowledgeable about photography. So I'm very happy he's part of our Strudel Media Life team. And I'm, in, I'm especially happy that Eileen uh, is here today to uh, present her work. And I will now hand this over to Kai, who will introduce Eileen. Thank you so much. Have fun, everybody. Thank you, Anya. Um, so I actually have quite a bit of an introduction to do here. So I'm gonna to try to get it through it quickly so we can start looking at photographs and hearing Eileen speak. But um, when Anya told me about this idea of uh, inviting another photographer and doing this to support the Migrant Kitchen, I immediately thought of Eileen, partly because her work does deal in uh, politics and the things that are going on today, and also because of her the fact that she primarily works from her studio and at home, and so I thought it would also be good giving uh, during this pandemic and people trying to struggle to figure out how to do their work. Um, I met Eileen Quinlan almost 30 years ago at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts and we've been friends ever since and uh, following each other's work. So I'm intimately familiar with the work she's been making and uh, this current body of work that I've asked her, or this body of work I've asked her to present for today, it was a little shift away from some of the other work she had been doing and I also thought was appropriate for us to look at. Um, but just to give some uh, sort of standard bio background, uh, Eileen was born uh, in Boston in 1972, along with her twin sister, Kate, who uh, I both I met both of them at the museum school and uh, Eileen's photographed her sister and it's some uh, sort of like a recurring presence in her work. So I thought it was worth mentioning uh, Kate here as well. And then Eileen went on years later to go to Columbia University for the MFA program and uh, seeing what happened to her and her work there has also inspired me to apply to grad school at Columbia and part of the reason that I went there, or a big part of the reason why I went there. So uh, I just want to talk a little bit about her accomplishments since she graduated, just to give a little bit of a background of uh, where her practice has been going and then tie it into a little personal and then I'll turn it over to her. So in the, uh, she graduated in 2005 from Columbia with her MFA. Four years later, she had a, uh, her first solo museum show at the uh, International Center, uh, I mean, sorry, the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston, which was a place that we used to go all the time. Uh, her work is in the permanent collections of the Museum of Modern Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Whitney Museum of American Art, the Guggenheim, uh, LACMA, Museum of Contemporary Art, uh, Hammer Museum, List Visual Arts, uh, MIT List Visual Arts Center, and on and on. So uh, her work has been out there for a while and She's uh, had many exhibitions and been uh, talked about in terms of 
uh, there was a sort of new wave of uh, photographers dealing with abstraction that Eileen's work was uh, spoken about. Maybe we'll, we'll see that in the first body of work that she shows before the Dune Woman. Um, just to give a little bit of the artistic practice, here's a quote from, she's represented by Miguel Abreu Gallery in New York, and here's a quote from the bio on her page. Eileen Quinlan is interested in the false transparency of the photographic image. It's not a window, but a mirror. Color, atmosphere, composition, and description are reduced to their most basic forms, taking turns as the central subject of the photograph. Quinlan's process of experimentation with a limited set of materials is elaborated through brute repetition, demystifying the circumstances of each image creation. And we're gonna see that, especially in the first body of work, but also just, I thought it was inspiring how Eileen does work with these limitations, physical and otherwise, and how uh, this current, this body of work we're gonna talk about today grew out of that. So I think that's very important. And uh, I also wanted to just tie it back to a personal note. Uh, in the early 2000s, uh, Eileen and her uh, husband, the painter Cheney Thompson, had this large studio building in Northern Brooklyn where all of the artists' friends would sort of come together as a salon and talk about art and politics. And they were living there and the, you know, all the creative stuff was going on there. And they continue to this day that there's this idea of like having the domestic and your art practice tied together and uh, not having these things separate, but having ways of pulling these things together. And so some of the photographs you're gonna to see today uh, were photographed in Eileen's studio. Some were photographed actually in her, her shower and her house, uh, her apartment that's not too far from the studio. And they've, they've always been sort of incorporating these things together. And I also thought it was important uh, to bring her together because she, her practices found different ways of incorporating um, the things that have been influencing her, whether it's literature, uh, the, you know, the current political situation, uh, motherhood, uh, you know, machinations of the art world, but she's found ways of incorporating these things without um, just stating them like going out and photographing people protesting, for example, but rather through a lens and thinking about how to use the creative tool and how to actually express something through her vision of how she has this uh, very specific artistic, artistic practice, but have these things come in as currents in and out of the work. So that, that was also, uh, I think a lot of times artists struggle with figuring out how to, you know, deal with these issues that they're, you know, these emotions that they're feeling and finding a way to incorporate them without, you know, uh, becoming a news reporter or something, for example. So that was another reason why I thought it would be great to have her. Uh, as I said, we've known each other about 30 years. And so I've seen this work progress. And this body of work I felt like was a bit of a, a departure. And I think there's a couple of things that are important about it that we could uh, expand the conversation with. So without further ado, and with that very long introduction, uh, I want to have you all say hello to Eileen Quinlan. Hey, Eileen. Hey, everybody. I hope you can hear me. I just realized my chair is very creaky. That's one of the things that you uh, figure out when you start zooming a little bit. So I'm going to go through some bodies of work. I'm going to start with the smoke and mirrors series of pictures that I was making in the early aughts. What you're seeing right now is one of the smoke and mirrors pictures. Uh, it's a series of work that I started when I was in graduate school at Columbia. I began this work probably in about 2003. These images were printed for my thesis show in 2005, and I'll go through them here. They're analog C prints, and what I was doing at the time was finding a way to work in the studio after many years of shooting out in the world, of documenting landscapes, of photographing my family, doing street photography. The one thing I was certain about when I went to grad school was that I didn't want to work um, out in the world. I wanted to try working in the studio, which is something I had never done. My husband's a painter and I was sharing a studio with two other artists who were also um, working as, one was a, another was a painter and um, our other studio mate was a mixed media artist, but they were all working on projects in their studio that they could spend time revisiting and tweaking and that would stay relatively unchanged in between sessions of working. And that was something that I, I really wanted to try as a photographer to spend more time with something, peeling back the layers of it and working it on it in an iterative way. So I started arranging these still lives. And what I was using was um, mirrored tiles that I bought at Home Depot 
I was using gels and pieces of foam and the kind of things that a lot of commercial photographers have around their studio. And I think I came to working this way for a number of reasons. I started photographing smoke actually because I was, I, I began um, a series of photographs where I was trying to deal with spirit photography, which is something that I've always been interested in. How photography gives evidence of things that are unseen. I'd been looking at 19th century ghost photographs that happened to coincide, you know, the invention of photography coincided with the Civil War and a major spiritualist moment in this country. So those two things have always been linked historically. I was thinking a lot about these ghost pictures and I was trying to create some of my own by photographing smoke as a kind of spectral body. But I quickly realized that smoke is actually really hard to render. And so I was going through um, all these processes of testing how to photograph it. Initially, I planned to put it in a more, um, in a scene with people where a specter would appear in the background. I'd never worked in a really abstract way with photography before, but at this time I was trying to figure out how to get the smoke to appear so that it could be in a more narrative kind of setting in the photographs. And I started isolating it and photographing it alone. And then I realized that these tests that I was producing, that, which were pictures of the smoke, were really where my interest um, was starting to go. And I let go of this notion that I was photographing smoke and started just working with the smoke formally, having a little less of a sense where I was going with it. And fortunately, uh, my teacher, well, several of my teachers at Columbia, but most notably Dana Hoey, who was one of the people I worked with very closely there, she encouraged me to keep going, even though I wasn't really certain what I was trying to say with these pictures. And over time, I realized that I was processing you know, years of working commercially with photography. I wasn't a commercial photographer myself, but in the interim between art school, I finished the museum school in 1996 and going to Columbia, um, I, I had you know, several years off, six or seven years off. And during that time I worked in advertising. I never thought I could make a, a living as an artist, but I, I worked in advertising and I worked as an assistant to commercial photographers. And I learned all these skills. One of the photographers I shared a studio with uh, was a, a photographer of makeup for Clinique. So uh, what I was saying was that I continued working with, uh, with these images because I was processing these years that I'd worked in commercial photography. And I was thinking about how these photographers I'd been exposed to were um, staging products in a seductive kind of atmosphere. When I was first talking about this work, I was telling people that it was product photography without the product because it was, I was trying to emphasize the sort of Rococo space where products are staged. So I was thinking about the seductive atmosphere where someone might be, um, where a consumer might be convinced that they are interested in a product, but of course the product wasn't present. And I was trying to think about consumption and distraction and these things that I'd been exposed to working commercially and in advertising. So that was where the work began, processing these kinds of um, exposure to these kinds of mobilizations of, of, of different strategies to create desire in people that I associated um, with having something to do with, with selling them something, with coercing them and seducing them. And I had an opportunity to start showing this work. These pictures were all called smoke and mirrors. So there was a way of, you know, I would number them through the series and I think I got up into a couple hundred um, different iterations of it before I started moving in other directions. So it was a fairly long project. And Smoke and Mirrors was chosen as a title because it was literally what the pictures were depicting, but it was also a way of talking about how they involved a certain amount of deception or hucksterism. And when I had the opportunity to start showing these pictures in galleries, one of the first things I came up against was the fact that uh, I had to think about additioning them because as we all know, if you, um, or maybe some of you don't know, but I learned as I went out into the art world that you can't really, um, a, a photograph doesn't have value in an art context if it isn't artificially limited as an addition. So I started showing, uh, this piece was called the full edition of Smoke and Mirrors 24A. And it was six prints, um, of an, they were all identical from one negative, but it was considered one piece, the six panels. And I, I did this because I had asked a friend, what's, you know, the, the gallery who was giving me an opportunity to show in this group show had asked me what the edition size of the work was. 
And I said, um, I, I don't know. And I asked a friend who said a standard photo edition is five plus one AP. So I decided to show the whole edition, including the AP, six prints as one work, as a way of, of, of taking the reproducible mechanical function of photography and kind of turning it back into something that was unique. So the whole edition had to be purchased as one piece. And it created a little bit of consternation for the gallerists too, who also wanted to be able to sell these things separately. So it was a way that I could kind of think a bit about the artificial limits put on photographs and also talk about the way that these were indeed photographs and not paintings, which is the way some people were talking about them as having a relationship to painting. And I wanted to emphasize that I wasn't you know, necessarily interested in constructivism or neo-modernism but I was thinking much more about photography and about how it was a reproducible medium. So I, at this time, this was around 2007, 2008, I was thinking a lot about how these photographs that I'd been making dealing with abstraction were, were um, working in real life as physical things in a space. So I was dealing with additions. I was dealing with questions of scale. Like in this piece, this is a diptych where from the same negative, you have you know, a 30 by 40 inch print on the left and a 20 by 24 inch print on the right. And so I, was, I wanted to kind of put the viewer in the position of thinking about why they might prefer one or the other version of the print and what the scale itself was doing in terms of your encounter with the work. So again, I'm continuing to talk here just about this earlier period in my work when I was thinking a lot about these formats. And I was working with full editions of photographs. In this case, there are two full editions woven together into this larger piece on the wall. So I was thinking a lot about how people encounter an artwork in a space, and if it's immersive, how that affects you bodily. I was also thinking about the architecture of the place where I was exhibiting at this gallery in London, Campbell Presti, how these silver gelatin prints of mylar that I photographed in the studio started to echo the windows. So at this time, I'm very much thinking about photographs as physical things. This is more recent work that I've been doing. Instead of only working with the camera, I'm also working with a flatbed scanner where I'm taking a lot of the materials that I used to photograph, like gels and mirrors and pieces of fabric, and I'm moving them across the surface of the flatbed to produce these images. And these are printed in a different manner too. I've always worked in an analog fashion with photography, but because these come from the scanner, they're digitally output onto, um, onto pieces of dye bond. So these are UV prints, they're inkjets. And the panels, each panel is six feet high and they're all different widths. They're extractions, each one is a segment of a scanner piece that I created in the past working with the flatbed. And then I, I put these fragments together to create these larger images. This is another larger piece. The panels are always six feet tall so that they can be recombined. The idea is that this body of work is kind of infinitely reconfigurable. Since they're all six feet tall in different widths, in different widths they can be combined in different ways in different groups and reused. They don't always have to be presented in the same fashion. So this is fairly recent work. I'm going to move on a little bit so we can get into talking more about how I got to the project that we want to focus on. But I think, again, my work for, you know, many reasons, sometimes reasons of, of uh, lack of space, lack of time, or lack of resources has, um, Kai and I were talking about how it'd be interesting to focus on, like, the, the, this series of discussions is about what moves people. And one of the things that moves me as a photographer is thinking about how to work within limits and how limits can really structure um, your activities in a way that can be really productive. So there have been times when I didn't have a studio. And when I was at Columbia, the studios we had were very small. So it meant that you had to, I had to work on a smaller scale, arranging things on a small tabletop instead of having a large space to work or choosing to work in the studio instead of going out in the world and shooting because that wasn't so possible given the, you know, the constraints on your time when you're in school and also the expense of being in school limits things you can do. So I've always tried to find a way to make limitations work for me and working with the flatbed scanner is another generative thing I can do with a device that just happens to be sitting on my desk. You know, I use it to proof film that I was shooting for years. It was like a 
interim darkroom. And then I started realizing that the scanner could be used like a camera to generate more imagery using the same material. So what you see here is um, material that was scanned on the flatbed and then um, printed out onto these dye bond panels. I'm going to move on a little bit because I think it's important to talk about um, the Doom Woman project, the one I'll go into the most depth with. And uh, I'm, I'm going back in time a bit to 2010. This picture that you see on the screen, I shot it when I was, I think maybe 18 or 19 when I was first at the museum school. And I was working on a project for the gallery that I, um, that I work with in Paris and London. And in this project, I wanted to talk a little bit about the hand. And that's why I had gone back to this picture of my hand. I'd remembered that I took this picture and I found it and printed it. And for the first time in several years, I was putting a more kind of representational image in dialogue with the more abstract pictures I was making. And this series of work was all about touch. I wanted to act on this film that I was shooting in a way that I hadn't before. For all the photo nerds out there, you'll probably know what positive negative film is, but some people don't. It's a Polaroid product. Polaroid went under in 2008, but I've been hoarding tons of this film. I have a huge cabinet full of it behind me. And what's great about positive negative is it's, it's a four by five sheet film, but it produces what we would come to expect from a little Polaroid positive, but then also a viable negative that more prints can be made from. And what's special about this film is that it's extremely soft. So the emulsion allows for all kinds of interventions. And for a long time, I was trying to be careful with it. But in the process of shooting, I would, you know, it develops instantly and then it sits in a water bath, gets hung up and then it can be printed. And I would try to handle it gingerly, but I would very often scratch it or mar it just in the process of, you know, having a few sheets sitting in a holding bath. And then I started acting on it with more intention and wanting to bring my hand into, a, into contact with the surface of the film. I think you know the hand isn't something that's so easy to express in photography. We talk about the eye, and you know sometimes painters will talk about touch or the hand in painting. And I was looking for a way to express something of gesture and of my authorship in photography. So I started. I this in this exhibition, I showed the picture of my hand alongside these images that had been hand manipulated. It's a little bit what they look like up close. In this case, I was sticking two pieces of wet film together and pulling them apart, and it kind of tears at the emulsion. That's what produces those striations on the bottom. So there's a lot of chance that's involved in these procedures too. And I'll talk about it a little more later, but one of the things that I'm really inspired by is the way materials collaborate with us in the process of making. And this material, the expired Polaroid that I work with, it's kind of dying and producing all these strange artifacts, chemically breaking down. So it, it adds another layer to the things that I'm doing intentionally um, by photographing the pictures and then acting on them physically. So I continued with this idea. This work is slightly later um, than the pictures from the show in Paris. In this case, I let a piece of film soak, I think, for maybe a week or so until all that was left was a dusty residue, but it had this starry quality. So I see all kinds of things in these non-representational images, just as we all do. I think as humans, we have a desire to sort of narrativize or project onto, whether you're looking at clouds or you're looking at um, an abstract chemical image like this, you might see something topographical or something cellular. So. I was really interested in how these pictures carried other associations and in exhibitions I would be juxtaposing them with more representational images to try to to try to corral and maybe suggest how they could be read next to other things. Like for me these are very celestial pictures. I know other people might see other things in them and again they're totally not imaged by me. It's the material itself breaking down and producing these images. I started adding um, materials to the baths that I would keep the film in. Like in this case, you know, generally as I'm shooting, I'm always shooting something. I never just act on the film itself. It always goes through the camera. Um, I'm not sure why. I guess we all have rules that govern our behavior um, in our work. And one of mine is that the film gets shot. And in this case, maybe the thing I shot was out of focus or I wasn't satisfied with the image. So I would let it sit the longest in a bath, these pieces of film that I knew I didn't want to print as such. And I remember this day, the, the longer holding bath that had the 
pieces of film that I was going to really stress to the max. It was sitting there and someone in our studio had left a bottle of tequila on the counter and I poured it in the bath and it had this crazy cracking effect on the film that I've never been able to replicate. But the materials that are used, then they start to connect to all these other associations about people, about events. So, and it's not necessarily something that I communicate to, to the people who are viewing the work, but for me, it helps me understand it and sort of sequence it in a different way. Eileen, would, yes. I would say that it's one part of your practice is that you like to kind of like an experiment, you know, like set up conditions, either that frame you used to have for doing the smoke and mirrors and you, then you have wild cards, right? So then like yeah. you can't control the smoke exactly. You can manipulate certain things. You can change the gels, but you don't know what's going to happen. Same thing with the, with the film into the sodium sulfide bath. You, you, you kind of let go, you set up the conditions and then you sort of like run the experiment and see what comes out of it, right? That's true. And, you know, I stopped photographing in the world in some ways because I didn't like all the contingencies of going out to shoot. Like maybe you go to shoot a landscape and you can't, um, you can't work on a given day because of the rain or you schedule an appointment to photograph someone and they don't, they don't show up. But I think I'm always looking for ways for chance and for these other like unexpected occurrences to, to um, imprint themselves on the work. And working with these chemicals is one way to do that because there are certain things that I can expect, but it's not, things don't always go to plan. And, um, and with the smoke that I was photographing before, it was very hard to get the smoke to go where I wanted it to. And so that was almost like working with a person or having another kind of um, something with another agenda that was posing as my subject. So I think that's still important that that aspect be there somehow. Again, these are all the images that I was allowing to fully dissolve chemically and kind of working my way up to the Dune Woman show that I want to talk about at greater length. So there were various different things that I was doing when I decided that I had permission to act on this film. I was soaking it in different things, like I said, tequila, vinegar. Um, sometimes the underlying image is more or less visible. One of the things I started doing was manipulating this packet of chemistry that you can see in the sheet of 4x5 film. There's a little note that says, do not touch here. And it took me years to realize that maybe I could manipulate that packet. And I started smashing it before I would put the film in the camera and it caused these great voids to develop. So there were ways that these chance procedures started to interact with the things that I was photographing more intentionally. This was an image of my twin sister and you can just barely see her arms. And then there's this great void in the center. So again, chance and intention were two things that I was trying to balance um, working with this material. And sometimes I would also um, scratch the surface of the film with tacks, with steel wool as a way of leaving another kind of mark, another sort of um, awareness of my presence as someone authoring these images. I think people have a way of, again, looking through photographs to the thing that they're seeing and identifying with it, which is beautiful. But I'm sometimes looking for ways to, again, announce that the photograph is constructed and that it's made by someone and that my presence is felt in a different way. Uh, this is one of the nudes that I'll talk about a little more in a few minutes. And what you see here are these kind of marks on the surface from processing the film in a water bath that was full of sand, which is something I came to photograph later for the Dune Woman project. So that's where those kind of holes um, come from is pushing this piece of film around in a sandy bath. These are just more hand processing of the Polaroids. And I've, I've continued to photograph sand, thinking about this project Dune Woman, which came the title comes from Woman in the Dunes by Kobo Abe, and I'll talk about that a little more later. So sometimes I'm re-photographing downloaded images of sand and dunes, and other times I'm actually photographing the sand itself, in this case in a litter box um, under my four by five, and I'm making these gestures in the surface. So again, thinking about the hand and about gesture and touch is something that started about 10 years ago in my work. And sometimes gesture is expressed as it is in this image on the flatbed scanner by moving materials and creating this kind of gestural mark. This was a re-photographed image. I'm gonna talk about that a little more um, soon when I talk about the show that uh, I wanna focus on. But basically when I started working with that picture of my hand that I showed you earlier from 2010, I'm bringing representational images into a dialogue with these more abstract pictures 
thinking about how all the pictures work in constellation with each other. And I started realizing that I needed certain kinds of images in order to flesh out bodies of work because of whatever I was trying to say in a given context. And in an exhibition I did in 2005 here in New York, I, I was thinking a lot about nature and I realized I wanted images of certain animals, but instead of going to photograph them, I downloaded them and re-photographed images from the internet. So it was the first time that I was working with appropriated imagery and that's something I've continued to do and also have conflicted feelings about it sometimes because um, I know that these images come from somewhere and were authored by someone. But there's a part of me that feels like um, as they exist on the internet, they're a part of a commons and a sort of shared sense of what, uh, you know, I was curious when I typed into, a, fo into a, a search engine, the word fox, what kind of images would appear as if there was a kind of hive mind understanding of what a fox was. So I took one of the first images and re-photographed it rather than trying to go out and find a fox for myself. So I'm still asking myself questions about what constitutes authorship and authenticity and whether or not it's okay to, um, to re-photograph other photographs. And in this work too, I was thinking a lot about the digital versus the analog. It's kind of hard to see on your screen, but the image of the fox is pretty low resolution. So there's a place where the, the digital grain of, of, the, of the original source image interacts with the fine grain of the four by five film. And the disruption you see on the right, that's the Polaroid itself, just kind of um, because it's expired, it, it partially dries and it doesn't develop. So those things appear accidentally. Around this time when I was working on the show where I was photographing the fox, the Paris attacks um, took place. And Paris photo was happening at that time when the Bataclan theater was attacked in the cafes. And uh, it, it was a really scary moment. And so while I was downloading these nature images to re-photograph, I started re-photographing some of the images of the shattered cafe windows. So there are some gunshots that come into um, the work that I was making and I continue to think about what that represented. It becomes part of this later project. I wanna read this quickly. It's from the Gutai Art Manifesto. And the reason that I, I bring it up here is because um, when I, the, the nudes that I'm going to talk about shortly that play a big role in in the project, uh, the Dune Woman project, I started making those after the birth of our second child. And I was shooting in the shower because I found it very hard to get to the studio. And around that same time, I was invited by A. Arakawa, um, an artist that I know here in New York, to participate in a performative lecture that he was giving in the Gutai show, which was taking place here at the Guggenheim Museum. I didn't know that much about the Japanese Gutai artists at the time, but he gave me um, the show's catalog and asked me to re-photograph from the catalog as a, way of, um, as a way of getting some images into this performance that he wanted to do. And so he invited me to produce these pictures for him. And I read the Gutai Art Manifesto and it really affected me. It helped me understand the way that I'd been working with material. I'm gonna read it really quickly. And I realize that we're running out of time, so. I'll continue moving through to the project, but I'm gonna read this right now. This was written in 1956. The Gutai artists were kind of Japan's answer to abstract expressionism. And uh, this is a part of their manifesto. Let's bid farewell to the hoaxes piled up on the altars and in the palaces, the drawing rooms and the antique shops. They are monsters made of the matter called paint of cloth, metals, earth and marble which through a meaningless act of signification by humans through the magic of material were made to fraudulently assume appearances other than their own. These types of matter, bushitsu, all slaughtered under the pretense of production by the mind can now say nothing. Lock up these corpses in the graveyard. Gutai art does not alter matter. Gutai art imparts life to matter. Gutai art does not distort matter. In Gutai art, the human spirit and matter shake hands with each other while keeping their distance. Matter never compromises itself with the spirit. The spirit never dominates matter. When matter remains intact and exposes its characteristics, it starts telling a story and even cries out. So this was very, you know, it, this was a very useful thing for me to be considering at the time because of the way that I was already working with um, material as a kind of collaborator. And this really excited me. And I continued to think about how I could do that with this series of pictures that I was taking in the shower. 
This is a picture from the Venice Biennale. I showed a, a series of nudes um, when I was invited to participate in 2017. These are all black and white gelatin silver prints. They're 20 by 24 inches. I'll go through them individually. What I started doing at this time, I was, um, as I said, we'd had our second child and I was finding it very difficult to get to the studio. And one day I was taking a shower and I, you know, when you have an infant in the house, maybe you take a shower every two or three days and it was the only time I had to myself. And I started thinking about my work and how I wanted to be closer to it. And I realized that I could start making pictures right there in the bathroom because I was looking at the glass wall of the shower and I was thinking of it as having something to do with the mirrors that I'd been photographing in the surface of the flatbed scanner and how I could distort my body against this surface and I could light it in certain ways. So I brought a little point and shoot camera into the bathroom, set up the timer and started posing these pictures. And I was also thinking about, you know, making the most of, you know, the constraints that I had in terms of my time and my ability to work. Also the othering that happens with your body when you have a child um, and you start to, you know, think of your body as having these other functions and it's somehow not entirely your own anymore. I was thinking about aging, you know, entering middle age, uh, wanting to look at pictures of women's bodies that weren't exactly like the ones that we normally see in black and white nudes. So all of these things were operating in my consciousness. I was also thinking about feminist artists from Ana Mendiada to Jenny Seville who've worked with glass as a kind of distorting and, and as a metaphor for the kind of limitations that are put on women. So that was very much in my mind when I was constructing these images. I'll just go through them quickly. So again, they're shot in the bathroom and then re-photographed onto the Polaroid where I can work on the surface. And I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna just move, I was gonna talk a little bit about maintenance work, which was, I learned about Merle Lauterman Euclid's project in 2016 and it was very influential for me. She's a performance artist in the 60s who worked with the Department of San Sanitation here in New York. Um, this, there was a show that took place at the Queens Museum in 2016 where she talked about care work and maintenance work and um, would do performances where she would clean the steps of different um, arts institutions and thinking about the domestic and about the kind of work um, the Sisyphean labor that takes place in the home was something that led me to think about Kobo Abe's book, Woman in the Dunes, and the uh, Hiroshi Teshigahara film that was made the year after the book was written in 1964. This was something I saw at the museum school. So that's where Dune Woman comes into it. This is a still from Teshigahara's film. And the story of Dune Woman, it's about uh, a, a man who's a kind of amateur entomologist living in Tokyo. He goes on a weekend retreat to collect bugs in a remote village. He misses the last bus home and the villagers send him to stay with a woman who has a room for him. But this woman actually lives in the bottom of a sand pit. And it's, it's her duty to shovel the sand out of this pit um, every day so that it doesn't encroach on her village. Her house is kind of the bulwark against this moving sand, dorm, uh, sand dune. And the man becomes trapped in the pit by the villagers where he helps this woman shovel the sand. And it's, it's a great book and also for me felt like a metaphor for the Sisyphean cycles of domestic labor that I was thinking a lot about, um, trying to be an artist and a mom at the same time. So I called the show that I did um, for Camp Lee Presti in 2017, Dune Woman. I'm showing you pictures of the installation because I did it in a kind of novel way. I put all the work in the back room of the gallery. So when you enter the space, this is what you'd see. And then when you came around the corner, you'd realize that all the pictures were hanging on the back wall. Part of the reason I did that was because I wanted them to be understood as a constellation in relationship to each other. I'd also had them in my studio and looked at them in my studio that way over the many months that I was preparing for the exhibition. And I started to see all these relationships between the pictures, how, um, how the nudes and the pictures of stars going supernova, that image that looks like an eye to the right of the nude in the, in the top row, how all these things started to relate to each other. Maybe, um, you know, uh, um, let's see, there's, you see the third picture from the left is a picture of a storm. That storm started to, let me scroll down to it. So, you know, you, you start to find echoes between the images where a nipple starts to look like an eye where a storm starts to look like a tampon string. 
where these sandy surfaces start to look like skin. So I was thinking about all these relationships between images and how they existed in a kind of network. And I didn't want to necessarily separate them, though I don't think of this as one piece and I do think of these as discrete pictures. This show featured the pictures that I was making in post-pregnancy that had a new import after the election of Trump and all the talk of all his misogynist talk um, in the run up to the election. I felt like there was a new politics to shoving my ass up against the glass. And I wanted to present those pictures as an American artist showing in London just after Brexit and after Trump's election in 2017. And I also presented the eyes and the storms because it was an apocalyptic moment of real fear that Trump had entered the national landscape, was, going, was our new president, had pulled us out of the Paris Accords. I was thinking a lot about environmental collapse. There are images here from mass shootings. And, um, and you know, I was thinking about Hurricane Sandy and the extreme weather that we've been seeing around the world. So that's what the storms and the waves represented. So I put together these images of nature, these images of myself in a kind of confrontational stance in the shower as a kind of way of, of reflecting on Kobo Albe's book, Woman in the Dunes, which is about this existential struggle against a natural force of the sand and, you know, the Sisyphean labor um, that takes place in the home. And then also the, the show extended out from there to think about the current political moment that we were living in. I'll go through the pictures quickly, just in close up. Kai, maybe you want to jump in here? Yeah, well, I, I thought it would be, maybe you could just expand a little bit on, I think it's a little unusual for photographers, maybe, or an artist in general, to think so much about the, um, the exhibition space as, you, you think almost more like a curator in that this is several different bodies of work that you decide to put together and you, you really spend a lot of time thinking about how the viewer is going to encounter them in the space and the relationship, but not only between, you know, when you were talking about the additions earlier, but, you know, how everyone would walk into an empty gallery for an opening. And how, how do you think you came to this idea of using the opportunity of an exhibition to really author something new from the work you, you create constantly? Well, I definitely, I don't, like generally I don't make work for a show. I'm kind of always working on these different projects and strands and sometimes I'll go back many years. And, and so when I have an opportunity to show, then I do kind of, I curate from my own body of work and sometimes I'll create new things to fill gaps based on what I'm trying to say. But in this case, I was very much thinking about um, the Abe book and about the notion of, of maintenance work and care work and the kind of work that nobody really notices unless you're not doing it. And I liken that to the shoveling of the sand in the book. So I knew I wanted to work with sand, but then I was also you know, thinking about the apocalypse of, of that moment um, in 2017 when Brexit happened and Trump was elected. And so I, I was, I, I do think a lot about nature and include an idea of, of, you know, certain anxieties around the future of the planet in my work. So I was drawing on these images of storms and of waves. So I do, when I have a show, I just, I get together all these small images and I work with models to try to figure out how to kind of tell a story through the, the pictures in relation to one another. It's almost like um, constructing a sentence. And I felt like putting that work all on the back wall of the gallery made it a little more like a manifesto. It was, it was a little more of a statement that had to be taken as a singular thing in, in all the pictures relating to each other. And I liked the way that it forced people at the opening to all end up in one room, kind of frontally facing this wall. And because a lot of the images in this show, probably about half of them had been digitally sourced, it was another way to reference the screen. It was almost like a, like a, a search result that people were um, encountering as well. So I was trying to maybe somehow allude to the fact that some of these images were not taken, but but appropriated or found digitally. And again, when you see them in person, you can sometimes uh, make out some of the digital artifacts. Like this was a re-photographed image that was pretty low resolution. And this is chemically produced by a fully degraded piece of film. But this was also a re-photographed stock image of sand dune. This was one of my own nudes taken in the shower. And this here 
was also an appropriated and rephotographed storm because it wouldn't be so easy for me to necessarily find a storm to photograph. This was a NASA image of a star going supernova, but it had a real relationship to an eye. And I was thinking about sight and touch a lot, trying to emphasize the haptic in my photographs, which is another thing that the sand stands for. When you look at this print, you can feel the texture of that material. So I was thinking a lot about um, how, you know, in, in American culture and maybe a lot of Western culture, sight is the sense that's the most privileged, but I was thinking about touch and reading about like theorizing around touch and how it's a sense that um, it's not a distance, it's not a distancing sense the way sight can be, but it's involved with the kind of communion when you touch something. So all of those things factored into the choices that I made for this selection. Yeah, I thought it, I thought it was interesting that um, in your practice, like you showed the smoke and mirrors at the beginning. Um, I mean, I know a lot of other artists who kind of work in series, but maybe they work for like a year and then they move to the next thing. And you really spend a lot of time, you know, trying to exhaust all the possibilities of what you could do with, you know, two strobes, gels, the smoke, the mirrors and then you know all these iterations from there on and always working in the studio so i thought it was very interesting in this work where this other element comes in and you're working back on your own archive right you're pulling yeah. from photographs that you made when you're 18 years old till the present day when you're 22 uh -huh, up to uh pulling now pulling in from the internet right so did you feel that it was was there like for, because now a lot of people are stuck at home and can't go out and photograph what they want to. Was it a sense of frustration that brought you to like going and looking out that, that you couldn't go get the perfect storm so you had to find it? Or what was that impetus, you think? I think it was just a way of recognizing that a lot of us like reach out to the world through the computer and the way that there's a network of, of these images working together in my work. There's also a network of things that we can draw on through our access um, online. So I could bring the world closer without having to leave the studio. And I could also talk about things that I couldn't necessarily create for myself. There's a way that I can, you know, corral sand in a litter box and make it look like an actual dune. But, you know, it's, it's a whole other matter to try to replicate a storm. So I realized, you know, I knew I wanted to work with certain animals in, in different projects for symbolic reasons, the animals. And instead of trying to find an otter or a fox or a crow, I, I gave myself permission to source these things and to re-photograph them and through re-photographing them, hopefully to transform them enough to make them my own. But being able to download things allowed me to have a much broader conversation in my work than I could have before I could do that without without having to go anywhere or having to change, you know, my lifestyle. And also I, I sometimes wonder if we need more images. I'm interested in the idea of working with my own archive and not necessarily privileging what I'm making now over what I may have shot in the past. And so recycling and reusing is something that's a kind of politics in my work. And that goes to using other images as well that can be found, you know, in other places. But you do feel that urge to, not just leave it as it is, right? I mean, it feels much more like um, the Beastie Boys than it does Richard Prince. You're mm -hmm. like, you want to re-photograph it, you're going to manipulate it, you're going to bring it through your own process, right? So you're, there's that urge is still there. Even in the photographs of the nudes, you say you used a point and shoot camera, but then you re-photographed those too, right? So what's, what do you think that, what do you think that gesture is coming from? Well, I want to sort of bring all these different orders of images together, the ones that I'm shooting with a small point and shoot camera, the ones that I'm downloading and re-photographing. And the one way that I can kind of bring them all onto the same plane is by, is by um, inscribing them on this film that I really like using, which is the Polaroid 55 that allows for all this chemical manipulation and surface manipulation. So everything, including, you know, the small point and shoot camera that I use in the shower, it wouldn't be so easy to shoot myself in the shower with a four by five, you know? So I use this little camera and then I re-photograph those pictures on a copy stand onto this four by five, 55 film so that I can, I can manipulate the surface. So the film is the substrate that brings everything together, it brings it all onto the same plane of existence. So all these different kinds of images can talk to each other. So that's always the place where everything gets kind of, you know, uh, unified or, or 
I don't know. That's that's the substrate where everything goes. Yeah, it's a constant mediation. It's like this is the go-to place, right? Uh, and it also of, allows me to transform things. Like in this picture of the wave, I really, I worked the surface and cropped the image a lot. And so it does look quite different than it did in its original, um, in its original appearance. And so that's the way that I try to make it my own and not just fully lift it from its original context. One of the questions that came in was about the camera and that, that soaking process. So I, it's a four by five, like studio view camera, I assume. Yes. And then do you want to just elaborate a little bit on the peeling apart the type 55 and the bath you put it in it, like that? Sure. I mean, it's a, it's a sheet of film at a time that goes into the back of the camera and it develops instantly. So it doesn't need to be processed. So, you know, when you peel apart the Polaroid, you have your positive and then you have a viable negative, but the negative soaks in water, gets washed eventually, hung up to dry, and then it can be printed. But sometimes I would do things like let it soak much longer than it should, or put different materials in the holding baths, or act on the sticky surface of the film that wasn't totally dry. So that's how these effects are created. Great. Uh, another question that came in, which I think is interesting in terms of how the Dune Woman project came together is, do you, are you thinking of these concepts before you start making the work or or does it all come together later as like authoring a show or authoring something else from the work? It's always a little bit of both. I mean, I, I think that the reason that um, Dune Woman came to me was because I had watched the film again after having seen it in art school, but it brought together all these threads that I was thinking about, about the haptic, about I mean, it's a film that deals with the main character's kind of existential crisis being trapped with this woman. And it's a, a book that I would really recommend people to read if they can, Kobo Abe's Woman in the Dunes. But that book synthesized a lot of different things that I was thinking about, about Sisyphean labor and about misogyny. And there are all these questions of class in the book about the people who live in this very hostile place and this man from Tokyo who comes and is trapped kind of uh, in their position. So I, I have bodies of work that I can draw on and then usually there's something I'm reading or something I've been exposed to that might help me synthesize a bunch of things to put together for an exhibition. There's always things that I've already made that I can use and then sometimes there are things that I need to create in order to fill a kind of hole in whatever um, series I want to put together for the show. So I knew that I needed a storm, for instance, and I had one storm, but I needed to go find another one. So there were things that I created specifically for the exhibition, but then these images, you know, they're always addition, so they get used in other shows as well. And sometimes in other combinations, they have very different meanings. But I think of the pictures as signifying certain things. The wave stands for extreme weather, but it also stands for a kind of overwhelm and even a deluge of digital images of photographs. So there's all these um, different ways that you can read these things. And, and I, I have a curatorial um, approach towards exhibitions. Mostly I'm working with existing images that I, I'm just making somewhat instinctively and then sometimes because I need to illustrate something specific. They also incorporate language quite a bit if it's you know publishing the manifesto or talking about the things you've, yeah. you've uh, written or, or read, but you also uh, you talked about smoke and mirrors as a title with these dual meanings, but I think almost a lot of your work, you you let the some of the political or other overtones come in through the language of the titles, right? Yeah, and I mean sometimes those titles, I think they wouldn't be super clear to anyone else, um, but they help me locate myself in time in terms of what I was thinking about. Like a lot of the nudes have titles that have to do with parenting. Like um, one of them is called acting out. There's another one that's called let down, which is you know something that happens when you're nursing. Um, there's one called detachment for a style of parenting, attachment parenting. So you know the wave is called Luigi's nightmare because uh, and it's actually just a very kind of funny and more personal title because our son always Luther, we call him Luigi. He always dreams about waves and draws waves and. Um, my husband Cheney was actually he was in he was in Japan when um, the earthquake happened and the tsunami took place. He was there for an exhibition, and I guess that was in uh, 2011. And 
my son and I were supposed to join him there and we didn't go, but it was a very traumatic moment for our family. We're really worried about getting Cheney home. Luther was only four, but he's been drawing waves ever since that time because I think, you know, that really imprinted on him. So there are all these different ways that I'll use titles to find my way back to whatever I was thinking about at the time that I was making the pictures. And, you know, for, for instance, after I stopped calling things smoke and mirrors, a lot of the abstractions that I was making had perfume titles. And I did that because I wanted people to be thinking about the commercial images they may have seen that had some of the same effects. And a lot of them, you know, were pictures for makeup or for different brands of perfume. So, yeah, I use the titles to maybe create a suggestive space for people to read the work, but a lot of it would be totally um, the actual fact of it, what it means to me might not be legible for someone else, but they might have their own associations. Right. So we're winding down. I think we've got maybe another five minutes total. And another question that came in, which I thought was uh, maybe you could elaborate on, as you said, that in Western culture, uh, sight is the sense that's most privileged. Mm -hmm. uh, is there, did you want to say something more about that? Uh, I, I was reading this book by a theorist named Iris Marion Young, and she talked a lot about touch and, and she does talk about, um, the book is called Throwing Like a Girl. But um, in this one essay, she was talking about how uh, sight is, and I'm not sure how it came to be that way, but it's the sense that so many things are geared towards satisfying and that touch is, is less, um, is less uh, acknowledged or appreciated. And I, was, I think one of the things that's always frustr frustrated me about photographs is the fact that they don't really have a surface as a thing. It's really smooth. Um, but there's still a way that photographs can create a sense of, there's a haptic encounter you can have with a photograph because of the information that it communicates. So I was just thinking about, about touch and about this notion, not so much of judging things, but trying to commune with them through a, a kind of, you know, a literal connection. Um, and, and that was what I was working towards. And also just wondering if, like, it was just dawning on me that it doesn't have to be the way that we experience the world, that there's some kind of, um, that that was something that was instituted over time and not just a natural fact that that site should be the primary sense. But that's something I'm still trying to untangle. But also I just, when I think about touch and photographs, the way I've been acting on photographs is also about just making it clear that the photograph is being orchestrated by someone, that it didn't arrive fully formed without someone, you know, coercing it into shape. In other words, it always has a sort of orientation. It's never fully the truth. It's someone's perspective. And so by, you know, leaving a mark, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving a trace of myself as the person who made it. Yeah, I think also I remember you having conversations about your studio being right across from uh, Cheney's and he had all these, you know, amazing bolts of cloth and he has the paint going on the surface and then, you know, how do you try to, and you, were, you started photographing some of his materials to try to bring in that texture and touch before you started doing the peel apart negatives, right? Yeah, no, I, I we we did a show together very early on when I first started exhibiting. He was showing his paintings next to my photographs. And it was, we were kind of, we were trying to just have a conversation about, about, um, we had made these, we decided to make 20 pieces each and put them in dialogue with each other. 20 of my photographs, 20 of his paintings. We made them all the same size and framed them in the same way. So it was a little bit of a conversation about this different media and how people respond to it. Like what, how you feel when you stand in front of a painting knowing that it's a, a one-off unique thing as opposed to a photograph, which is a print and the different kind of auras that these media have. And so at that time, Cheney gave me some of the canvas that he was painting on for me to photograph. So we were just trying to collapse these different distinctions between painting and photography. But it's funny because sometimes people tell me they like my work because they don't think it's very photocentric, but um, they liken it to painting, especially when it's more abstract. But I, I couldn't do this kind of work in any other medium. It is extremely photographic and very much invested in photographic materials. But yeah. I'm always kind of dealing with painting on some level. Right. Yeah, but a very much a photographic practice, right? So Eileen and Kai, thank you so much. This was really wonderful. And I also want to thank uh, for all the, uh, for the big audience that we had today. So thanks everybody for being here.
Thanks, everyone. For and uh, hope to see you next week at the next lecture. Good to see your familiar faces and unfamiliar ones. And thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Wonderful. All right, Bye. everybody stay safe. <laughs> yeah. You too. Be well, everyone. Take care.